Each Layer 3 address has two points. So far we've learned about network models, protocol layering, and LAN technologies, specifically Ethernet technology. And in the last section, we learned about IP addressing, subnet masking, and routing IP packets through an Ethernet-based LAN. Now in this section, we'll discuss how these companies interconnect their geographically dispersed LANs using different Wide Area Network, or WAN, technologies. One key difference between a LAN and a WAN is that LANs are built, owned, and operated by individual companies and organizations. But unlike LANs, WANs are owned by third-party service providers. A company wanting to connect its geographically dispersed LANs must subscribe to a WAN service provider, such as a telephone company, to use or lease its WAN carrier network services. WAN service providers are also called service providers, telcos, WAN carriers, or just plain carriers. A company then uses the data links provided by these service providers to connect remote locations to each other or to access the Internet. Like Ethernet LANs, traditional WAN protocols operate at the physical and data link layers, or layers 1 and 2. Each WAN technology, such as the Point to Point Protocol, or PPP, or Frame Relay, uses a different Layer 2 frame format and provides different options for reliability and error recovery. In this section, we'll also cover Multi Protocol Label Switching, or MPLS, which isn't a WAN technology, but a WAN service offered by service providers. MPLS operates between Layer 2 and Layer 3, and some refer to MPLS as a Layer 2.5 protocol. Just as different Ethernet network devices, such as hubs, bridges, and switches, emerged to address specific network growth issues, WAN technologies also went through a similar evolution process. To explain these different WAN technologies, we'll revisit Acme Company and see how its growth required each different technology. If you've ever looked at a network diagram, you've probably seen a network cloud. This cloud typically represents the WAN, or the Internet, through which data travels to get from one LAN to another. A cloud is used to represent the WAN or Internet precisely because it's nebulous and hides the details of the service provider's network links and switching equipment. As a customer, you don't really need to know the exact path data takes through the provider's network to reach its final destination. In other words, data leaves one site, enters the cloud, and then somehow reaches the other. The path over which the data travels within the network cloud is the service provider's responsibility. But to understand WANs, you still need to be familiar with what happens within the cloud. Consider the network diagram shown on screen. In earlier sections, we discussed the LAN connectivity, the IP addressing scheme in use, and how data flowed between different LANs. We won't focus on the detail of LANs anymore in this section, so we'll simplify our graphic. When we last saw them, Acme was getting the network at its manufacturing facility up and running. Of course, once the LAN at the new facility was working, Acme wanted to connect it to the LAN at its corporate headquarters. To accomplish this goal, the company installed a WAN link to interconnect the LANs at each location. Before we delve into the details of Acme Company's WAN, let's first discuss some of the equipment and terminology used in a WAN environment. Earlier we saw that Acme installed a router to interconnect the different broadcast domains. Now the same router will interconnect Acme's geographically separated LANs. But to make this connection, Acme will also need to install additional equipment to connect its router to the service provider's network. Customer Premises Equipment, or CPE, is any communications equipment located on the customer's premises that is used to connect to the service provider's network. The customer can own the CPE or can lease it from the service provider. Acme uses its CPE to connect to the service provider's nearest exchange, or central office, often called a CO. A copper or fiber cable connects the CPE to the nearest CO. This cabling is often called the local loop, or last mile. The device generating the data is known as Data Terminal Equipment, or DTE. In this case, the DTE is Acme's routers. The device that actually puts the data on the local loop is called Data Communications Equipment, or DCE. The DCE, such as a modem, ensures that the data is in the correct format for the local loop. Let's see what these components look like in a different context. A PC is another example of DTE that might also use a modem, 
the DCE to access the local loop. The local loop can either be an analog line, like the voice grade phone line coming into your home, or a digital line like the ones used by companies. Earlier we learned that computers generate digital signals, specifically ones and zeros. The analog phone line, however, typically carries voice traffic, which is a continuous series of electrical pulses that vary over time, like waves. A digital signal is like a light switch. It is either on or off. An analog signal is like a dimmer switch, which can vary. As you probably know from your home computer, to send computer data over an analog phone line, you need a modem. A modem converts or modulates the digital signal into a format for the analog phone line. At the other end, a modem converts or demodulates the analog signal into the digital signal a computer understands. Analog phone lines are typically copper. Routers also generate digital signals, but they usually connect to a digital line, so a modem isn't usually necessary. Instead, a router can use a CSU-DSU to connect to a digital line. CSU-DSU stands for Channel Service Unit and Digital Service Unit. For more information on CSU-DSUs, click the link on screen, or click the Continue button to continue with this topic. Digital lines can either be copper or fiber. In fact, it is not the type of connection, copper or fiber, that dictates the type of line. Rather, it is the equipment being used on the line that dictates whether the line is analog or digital. After the data leaves the customer's location, it arrives at the service provider's central office. A CO is like a distribution center, sending data to other COs along the path to its final destination. Within any large city, a service provider might have several COs interconnected using high-speed fiber optic trunk lines. Some COs might connect to other service providers, such as international carriers. Within a central office, you'll find the different kind of switches that make this communication possible, some of which we'll cover later in this section. For now, the switches take the customer's data and send it to the correct location. Now that you know some of the terminology and concepts of WAN technology, let's take a look at the specific technologies used by WANs at Layer 1, the physical layer. Most people remember the days when traditional phone lines were used for both voice and data communication. Some of you might still use dial-up. In the old days, computers used modems to transmit digital data over these analog copper phone lines, and the fastest data transfer rate was only 30 kilobits per second. In this section, we're going to learn how WANs first went from using analog to digital phone lines and then ultimately to fiber optic connections, providing ever-increasing bandwidth at the physical layer. You've probably heard the terms T1 and T3 or E1 and E3 in connection with WANs. Perhaps you have also heard of SONNET or SDH. Let's take a look at what these terms mean, starting with T1. Unlike an analog or plain old telephone service line, which is referred to as a POTS line, a T1 line is a high-speed digital telephone line that transfers data at 1.54 megabits per second. You might remember from the earlier section on bandwidth that 1.54 megabits per second isn't very fast by today's standards, but back when they were developed, they were lightning fast. T1 lines are dedicated connections between two points, as you see here so they're also referred to as point-to-point -point connections. T1 lines are used to transmit voice and data between devices in North America and Japan. The T in T1 comes from the term T carrier system, a series of digital data transmission formats originally developed by the Bell system in the 1960s as a way to reduce the number of telephone cables in large cities. Originally designed for voice traffic, this system combines or multiplexes voice and data signals from different devices within a location into a single link using time division multiplexing, or TDM. With TDM, devices take turns transmitting a fixed amount of data across the link using a specific time slot or channel. 
A T1 line divides a single line into 24 different channels. You can think of a T1 line as a type of telephone service capable of transporting the equivalent of 24 conventional telephone lines over two pairs of wires. Instead of having individual phone lines for digital phones, fax machines, and computers, companies can use TDM and send all signals across a single T1 line. So how do you have 24 conversations occurring at the same time? To help explain this concept, let's look at a very simple TDM example. Here we have three devices wanting to share a single communications link. Each device is assigned a time slot from 1 to 3. Each device gets a turn to send data, and data from all three devices is placed into a single frame, so the data from each device is contained within its own time slot in each frame. The frame is sent, and then the process is repeated. If a device doesn't have any data to send, the time slot is left empty. Once transmitted, the data in each frame is sent to the corresponding time slot on the other end of the communications link. So a T1 line consists of 24 channels, also known as time slots, or DS0s, each operating at 64 kilobits per second. Each conversation, whether voice or data, is assigned to a specific time slot. Each time slot gets a turn to talk or transmit 8 bits at a time. Once all 24 time slots have had a turn, a bit is stuffed in for framing and synchronization, and the process is repeated 8,000 times a second. So if we do the math, we'll see that 24 time slots times 8 bits equals 192 bits. Add the extra bit we just mentioned, and you get 193 bits which constitutes a single T1 frame. If this process happens 8,000 times per second, then 193 multiplied by 8,000 times per second equals 1.54 megabits per second. As we just mentioned, a T1 line provides a customer with a dedicated connection from one location through the WAN carrier's network to a second location. Customers have a choice of allocating all of the time slots for data. or they can allocate all the time slots for voice. Or they can allocate time slots for any combination of voice and data. Each of the time slots in the examples we've been looking at can also be referred to as a DS0. DS0 is the basic digital signaling rate. DS stands for digital signal and is a system of classifying digital circuits according to the rate and format of the signal. A DS0 offers 64 kilobits per second of bandwidth the amount of bandwidth usually used for one telephone voice channel. A DS1 circuit is made up of 24 DS0s. You'll often hear people use the terms T1 and DS1 interchangeably, but technically speaking, they're not the same. The term DS1 refers to the digital signal service provided over the wire. A DS1 signal offers 1.54 megabits per second of bandwidth and has a specific format. It might be transported over a T1 line or another type of line. The term T1 refers to the physical line, which is copper wire carrying a DS1 signal. If a DS1 circuit is transported over another type of material, such as fiber, it is no longer a T1. In addition to a T1 line, you might also have heard of a T3 line, which is also known as a DS3. As we saw earlier with T1 lines, T3s are also built on the base DS0 signal. A T3 is 28 DS1s or 672 DS0s bundled together. Many people use the terms T3 and DS3 interchangeably as well. Like DS1s and T1s, a DS3 is the electrical signal carried on a T3 line, which is also copper based, running at 44.74 megabits per second including some overhead bits to provide bit stuffing, alignment, error checking, and in-band management. Years ago, when digital communication lines were very expensive, a company might not need 1.54 megabits per second between each location. Instead, a company might only need 384 kilobits per second, or 6 DS0s to one location, and 768 kilobits per second, or 12 DS0s to a second location, and purchase a fractional T1 service. In the example shown on screen, Acme Company has a 384 kilobits per second connection to Site A, 
and a 768 kilobits per second connection to Site B. The provider can offer the remaining 384K to other customers. Most companies now use the entire T1 line for data. For more bandwidth, service providers bundle T1 lines together and offer a bonded T1 service. Many businesses use T1s to connect to other locations or the Internet. In most other places in the world, customers use E1 services, where the E stands for European, in place of T carrier services. T1 and E1 services are incompatible, though both use the DS0 as the base signal rate. An E1 differs slightly from a T1 in that its data rate is 2.05 megabits per second and is comprised of 32 DS0s instead of 24. Earlier we saw that a DS3 bundles 28 DS1s. Here we see that an E3 bundles 16 E1s or 512 DS0s and has a data rate of 34.37 megabits per second. Today, even these faster speeds are not fast enough for most WAN service providers and even some of their customers. To build WANs fast enough to constitute the cloud you see in most network diagrams, carriers deploy fiber optic links, which are made of glass and can transmit signals at close to the speed of light, as opposed to the links we've discussed previously, which transmit signals through copper and are much slower. Just as with T1 and T3 lines used in North America and E1 and E3 lines used in Europe, similar standards were developed for fiber optic lines. Synchronous Optical Network, or SONNET, was developed first and deployed in North America. Synchronous Digital Hierarchy, or SDH, was developed later and, like E1 and E3 lines, was deployed in the rest of the world. The SONNET and SDH standards define a basic frame format and a hierarchy of signaling speeds. The two standards are not compatible, each using different frame formats and different base signaling levels. But to keep costs down, most Sonnet SDH hardware can be configured by way of software to support either standard. To find out more about the Sonnet and SDH standards, click the link on screen. Or click the Continue button to move on. Now that we've covered WAN Layer 1 technologies, let's move up the stack and take a look at what specific technologies are used by WANs at Layer 2. Remember that when we looked at Ethernet technologies, we saw how routers and switches use Layer 3 and Layer 2 or MAC addresses to get the data to its final destination. When data is going over a WAN, different Layer 2 technologies are used, but the basic concept is the same. A router first uses the Layer 3 address to determine the next hop along the way to the destination network. The next hop router strips that frame, performs a route lookup, and adds a new Layer 2 frame suitable for the receiving LAN. The point-to-point -point protocol, or PPP, frame relay, and ATM are all examples of Layer 2 WAN technologies. We'll start our look at Layer 2 by learning more about PPP. Let's return to Acme Company. At its new manufacturing location, it created five separate networks or broadcast domains and interconnected them using a router. To connect this location to the corporate network located at headquarters hundreds of kilometers away, Acme needed a permanent, dedicated connection and decided to lease a T1 line from its WAN service provider. This lease line, also known as a point-to-point -point link, provides a pre-established communications path between the two locations with a fixed amount of bandwidth, whether or not it is used. That solution resolved the layer one or physical layer issues. But like Ethernet LANs, WANs operate at both the physical and data link layers, or layers one and two. So let's go up a layer and see what happens at the data link layer of a WAN link. When the router at the manufacturing location receives a packet destined for corporate headquarters, 
it performs a route lookup and determines that the next hop is across the WAN. Once the router determines the next hop address, though, how does it encapsulate the packet for delivery over the WAN physical link? Just like LANs, each WAN connection type uses a Layer 2 protocol to transport IP packets across the physical link. One example of such a WAN Layer 2 protocol is PPP. PPP can transport IP traffic as well as other Layer 3 protocols, such as Novell's Inter-Network Packet Exchange, or IPX, and Apple Computer's AppleTalk. This section focuses on IP traffic. PPP is used over leased lines as well as dial-up connections. The process for encapsulating the data into a PPP frame is the same as it is for an Ethernet frame. Once the router encapsulates the IP packet in the Layer 2 PPP frame, the Layer 3 IP address isn't examined again until the PPP frame arrives at the destination router. There, the router strips the PPP frame, performs a route lookup, determines the next hop address, and encapsulates the packet into a new data link frame for delivery. Remember that a packet can be encapsulated using different technologies at different points along the path to its destination. A packet that is sent over a WAN using PPP can then be re-encapsulated in an Ethernet frame for routing over a LAN. Both the router at the manufacturing facility and the router at headquarters must be configured to use PPP as the data link layer protocol in their communications with one another, or the two routers won't understand each other. PPP was designed in the late 1980s to support communication between devices, such as routers, over lease lines. Back then, line quality was a major concern, so several mechanisms were built into PPP to help it handle and react to poor conditions. PPP is known as a connection-oriented protocol. Using PPP, two devices establish a formal connection that ensures that they are ready to communicate. Ethernet, on the other hand, is a connectionless protocol. With Ethernet, when a device wants to send data to another device, it just sends it it has no idea if the device is ready to receive it. In a PPP connection, the two devices can be end-user devices, routers, network access servers, or others. When the two devices want to communicate using PPP, they must first go through a formal connection establishment process using special PPP-specific protocols. This three-step process is sometimes called a handshake. First, using the Link Control Protocol, or LCP, Devices establish a connection and configure the link. Next, if required, the device can verify the identity of the other device by going through an authentication process. Finally, devices use a second PPP-specific protocol, the Network Control Protocol, or NCP, to configure the Layer 3 protocols in use on the link. Before devices can send data using PPP, both ends of the link must send and receive LCP packets to configure and test the link. Click the link on screen for more detailed information about PPP's LCP and how it establishes and negotiates a connection, or click Continue to move on to the second step. During the second step, a device can verify the identity of the other device by going through an authentication process. This step is optional. PPP was designed to work over a variety of links, such as dedicated point-to-point -point links, dial-up connections, and digital subscriber line, or DSL connections. For dedicated point-to-point -point links, authentication is not typically needed. 
On dial-up or DSL connections, an Internet service provider might want to verify the identity of the user, also known as the caller, trying to establish a connection. If the devices agreed to perform authentication, a series of authentication messages are sent to verify the caller. If authentication fails, PPP shuts down or terminates the link. If authentication is successful, the devices move on to the next step, NCP. Click the link on screen to learn more about the PPP authentication process or click Continue to move on to the third step of the handshake. Now that the first two steps are complete, we move on to the last step in the process, configuring the Layer 3 protocols in use on the link. PPP was designed to work with numerous Layer 3 protocols, such as IP, IPX, and Apple Talk. Once the connection is established, PPP uses a Network Control Protocol, or NCP, specific to each Layer 3 protocol to establish and configure the different Layer 3 protocols running over the connection. For example, devices in an IP-based network use the IP Control Protocol, or IPCP, to configure, enable, and disable the IP protocol on both ends of the point-to-point -point link. IPX uses IPX Control Protocol, or IPXCP, and AppleTalk uses AppleTalk Control Protocol, or ATCP. As we just saw when establishing a connection, both sides of the WAN must agree on everything before the data can be transmitted on the link, including which IP addresses will be used. This process is very different than with LANs. WAN devices running PPP use IPCP to configure the IP addresses in use and optionally request the use of a compression protocol. For those of you who remember dial-up, in the few seconds it took for your PC to connect with your ISP or office network, the two devices were using PPP to determine your PC's IP address. In fact, many DSL services continue to use PPP today. For more details on IPCP, click the link shown on screen, or click the Continue button to move on. Once the three-step process is complete, the devices can send data across the link without having to add explicit addresses to the frame, unlike Ethernet, where addressing information is included in every frame. The connection is typically maintained by sending periodic messages called keep-alives. When the devices are finished sending data, they can terminate or end the connection. Like Ethernet, PPP also defines a standard frame format. When the router needs to send data across the point-to-point -point line, it encapsulates it in the PPP frame shown on screen. Let's take a look at the fields in a PPP frame. Roll your mouse over the other fields to learn about them. As the Acme company grows and establishes remote sales offices, as well as added manufacturing locations, the network continues to grow. One approach is to lease additional dedicated point-to-point -point links, one for each remote location. This solution, however, might not be the most cost-effective, which leads us to a discussion of a different WAN technology, Frame Relay. PPP is an effective solution for businesses or organizations with multiple locations that need to communicate over a WAN. One drawback, though, is that PPP requires a dedicated circuit between each location. These circuits are called leased lines, and while they are owned by the service provider and not outright by the customer, no other devices can send information across that circuit. While leased lines provide guaranteed bandwidth between sites, they tend to be expensive and companies pay for network capacity they might not fully use. In our example, every new Acme Company location requires an additional leased line and an additional router port at corporate headquarters. But what if you need to add five new locations or 10? At corporate headquarters, not only will you need five or 10 new leased lines, which are extremely expensive, 
You might even need to get a new, larger router with additional router ports to handle those new locations. Frame Relay, another WAN technology that operates at the data link layer, was developed as an alternative to dedicated leased lines for site-to-site -site communication. Frame Relay is an example of a packet switch network. With Frame Relay, customers still have a leased line, but only until they reach the service provider's network. The service provider can then establish multiple virtual connections running over a single leased line. A virtual connection is also known as a virtual circuit or logical circuit. When two sites need to communicate, the service provider configures a virtual circuit to get the data from one site to another. To the customer, a virtual circuit looks and acts just like a physical dedicated connection. Because multiple virtual circuits can run over a single physical connection, customers can communicate with multiple sites without installing additional lease lines. When a new connection is required, the provider simply provisions a new virtual circuit between the locations using the same physical connection. Because multiple customers connect to the same network, within the network, service providers share network resources among many customers, reducing everyone's costs. Because many customers use the same public network, Frame Relay is an example of a Layer 2 Virtual Private Network, or VPN. A VPN is a private network built across a public network, such as the service provider's network or the Internet. In the case of Frame Relay, the service provider keeps customer traffic separated using virtual circuits. Like PPP, Frame Relay is a connection-oriented protocol, meaning that unlike Ethernet, a connection must be established before any data can be sent. Different virtual circuits are defined for different customers. Even though all customers' virtual circuits share the same physical links within the provider's network, each customer's data stays within its own dedicated virtual circuits. Because the network is shared by many customers, it is standard practice for service providers to oversell or oversubscribe the service, banking on the fact that not all customers will try to use it at the same time. Otherwise, it would be like trying to build a highway for the maximum number of cars that would use it. While there might not be any traffic jams, most of the time the highway would be unused, which would make it a very expensive highway. Virtual circuits come in two types. A permanent virtual circuit, or PVC, is very much like a leased line. With a PVC, the service provider defines a path through the packet switch network to each customer location. PVCs are always on and ready to use. Switched virtual circuits, or SVCs on the other hand, are dynamically established only when there is data to send and terminated when transmission is complete. We're going to focus on PVCs because most frame relay networks use PVCs. Let's look just at Acme Company's traffic, which flows primarily between the remote locations and corporate headquarters. Notice that the remote locations do not have PVCs connecting them. This type of topology is known as a hub and spoke network because there is one router, the hub, that has a connection to each of the other routers, the spokes. Here's a simplified view of a hub and spoke network. Traffic from a spoke must go through the hub to reach another spoke. If a new location is added, the provider must configure an additional PVC. While this topology is cost-effective, data actually traverses the carrier's network twice, increasing delay and using valuable bandwidth at the hub. If all locations need to communicate frequently, or a high level of redundancy is required, customers can opt for a full mesh topology where each site has a PVC to every other site. While this solution provides a high level of redundancy, like dedicated PPP links, it's quite costly and difficult to manage. For each new location, a new set of PVCs needs to be configured for each location. Imagine if you already had 100 locations and needed to add one more site. Frame Relay PVCs are identified by a Data Link Connection Identifier, or DELC, which is similar to an address. The DELC is assigned by the service provider and included in each Frame Relay frame. Just like PPP, Frame Relay is a connection-oriented protocol, meaning that a connection must be established between devices before data can be sent. So addresses aren't necessary. With Frame Relay, however, more than one connection or virtual circuit exists on a single physical port. So DELCs simply identify the virtual circuit used to get to a specific device. Unlike Ethernet frames, which include a source and destination address, Frame Relay frames include only a single DELC identifying the connection 
and are assigned by the service provider. This number is only significant on the link connecting the customer's router and the provider's frame relay switch. Because routers do not advertise DELCs, the providers can use the same numbers elsewhere in the network. And because the DELCs only have local meaning, a virtual circuit can have different values at each end. For instance, in the example shown on screen, consider the virtual circuit shown in red between the router at Site A and the router at Headquarters. The router at Site A and Switch 1 identify this connection using DELC16. But the router at Headquarters and Switch 2 identify this connection as DELC101. In fact, the frame relay network really only exists between the router and the provider switch. What happens inside the cloud, or how the data gets from one end of the virtual circuit to the other, might be different from provider to provider. Frame relay does not define a standard way of switching data inside the cloud. Now let's take a look at the frame relay frame format to see where the DELC is located. Here you see the frame relay frame, which is very similar to the PPP frame we saw earlier. It has the same 8-bit flag, indicating the start or end of the frame as well as a 16-bit frame check sequence. The frame relay header is located in the 16-bit address field. The DELC makes up the majority of the header. The DELC is a 10-bit field with the first 6 bits in the first byte of the address and the last 4 bits in the second byte. The command response bit is not used by the frame relay network. The extended address bit allows the length of the frame relay header to be extended from 2 to 3 or 4 bytes. The EA bit is the first transmitted bit of each address byte. If this bit is turned on, the current byte is the last address byte. Most implementations use a 2-byte address where the second EA bit is turned on. The remaining three fields in the header are used to manage network congestion, which could occur in an oversubscribed frame relay network. Click the link on screen to learn how the FECN, BECN, and DE bits of the frame relay header are used to handle network congestion. Or click the Continue button to continue with this topic. Notice that the frame relay header does not include a layer 3 protocol field like a PPP header does. To specify the layer 3 protocol, frame relay standards include a network layer protocol identifier, or NILPID. A NILPID is similar to the type field in an Ethernet frame. When the router wants to send an IP packet over a frame relay network, it adds a NILPID, indicating that the upper layer protocol is IP. Then the router adds the frame relay header, including the appropriate DELC. When we move back to our network diagram in a moment, we'll show this frame in a condensed format shown on screen. The router sends this frame on to the frame relay network. The frame relay switch reads the DELC in the frame relay header, examines the lookup table, and determines the outgoing interface. Earlier we mentioned that there isn't a standard for switching data inside the cloud. In this network, the lookup table includes the outgoing interface as well as the new DELC of the next segment of this virtual circuit. In the example on screen, the lookup table indicates that data received on port 1 DELC 16 should be sent out on port 2 DELC 267. The switch changes the frame's DELC number and forwards the frame to the next switch. This switch knows the segment it just received data on as port 1 DELC 267. Its table indicates that the data should be sent out on port 4, DELC 101. Again, it changes the frame's DELC number. Then it delivers the data to the destination router on the frame relay network. Notice that the frame relay switches examine only the frame relay header, not the IP header, to make a forwarding decision. Once the frame reaches the destination, the router strips off the frame relay header, examines the NILPID, and determines that the upper layer protocol is IP. Next, it examines the destination IP address and looks for this network in its routing table. Once the data reaches the destination router, it leaves the WAN altogether and begins its journey on the next LAN. For Acme Company's growing network, Frame Relay is a cost-efficient choice to connect their remote locations to their corporate headquarters over T1E1 or T3E3 lines. 
This solution is ideal for intermittent data traffic between locations that is not delay sensitive. Since the frames that carry the data are variable in length, network congestion problems can arise when larger frames queue up ahead of shorter, delay sensitive frames, such as voice or video. If Acme Company needs higher bandwidth connections to support delay sensitive traffic, like voice or video, in addition to data traffic, it might need to consider a different network technology, such as ATM, which we discuss in the next section. Asynchronous Transfer Mode, or ATM, was originally developed as a high-speed LAN and WAN networking technology. ATM can transport voice, video, and data on the same network with guaranteed performance or quality of service for each type of traffic. ATM works at the data link layer and runs over a variety of physical layer networks. Today, ATM is used primarily as a WAN backbone technology and service provider networks. ATM as a LAN technology never took off because of the complexity of the protocol and the high cost of network adapters. Residential users and small businesses also commonly use ATM for Internet access, though they probably don't even know it. If you have a high-speed Internet service using your existing phone lines, chances are your data is running over an ATM connection. Residential and business DSL connections often use ATM at Layer 2. In this section, we'll take a quick look at ATM. ATM is a cell switching technology, which means that Layer 3 packets are segmented into fixed-length 53-byte cells. It differs from other Layer 2 packet switching protocols, such as PPP, Frame Relay, or Ethernet, which simply encapsulate packets in variable-length Layer 2 frames. The fixed-length cell allows very fast switches to be built, because the switches don't have to spend time determining the start and end of a variable-length frame. The fixed cell size also ensures that delay-sensitive data, such as voice or video, is not adversely affected by long data frames. Even though it uses fixed-length cells, ATM is also considered a packet switch network, where many customers share the service provider's network resources. Like Frame Relay, ATM allows a single physical connection to communicate with multiple devices using virtual connections. ATM standards define two types of ATM connections, virtual channel connections, or VCCs, and virtual path connections, or VPCs, which contain a group or bundle of VCCs. Let's start with the VCC. An ATM VCC is very similar to a frame relay virtual circuit. A VCC is a logical connection between two devices or endpoints, and is sometimes referred to as a virtual circuit. A VCC is identified by a Virtual Channel Identifier, or VCI, just like a Frame Relay Virtual Circuit is identified by a DELC. A collection of VCCs can be bundled together into a VPC, or Virtual Path, which is identified by a Virtual Path Identifier, or VPI, for which Frame Relay has no equivalent. Just like Frame Relay DELCs, ATM VPI and VCI values may differ from one link to another on the path between two locations. The combination of VPI and VCI identify the circuit. So in our example on screen, if headquarters needs to send data to Site 2, the headquarters router would send it on the circuit identified by VPI0 slash VCI202. Let's take a moment to see why the combination of VPI and VCI uniquely identify the circuit. Notice in this diagram, a single physical interface has two different virtual paths, containing two virtual connections each. Here we show how VPI and VCI values are commonly expressed. The VPI value is expressed first, followed by a slash, and then the VCI value. Notice that each virtual path identifier must be unique on its interface and each virtual channel identifier must be unique on its virtual path. But the same virtual channel identifiers can be used on different virtual paths. In this sense, VPIs and VCIs are like telephone numbers, where VPIs are like the country codes and VCIs are like the rest of the phone number. Within each country code, every phone number is unique. But the same phone number can be used in different country codes. The same is true of VPIs and VCIs. ATM is connection-oriented, just like Frame Relay. 
so a virtual channel must be established before any cells can be sent. Just like Frame Relay, ATM supports permanent virtual connections, or PVCs, and switched virtual connections, or SVCs. PVCs are good for connections that are always in use or are in frequent high demand. If connections change frequently or are used for on-demand services, SVCs are a better option. These connections are set up when needed and torn down when no longer in use. Also like Frame Relay, many customers use the same public ATM network, making ATM another example of a Layer 2 VPN. The virtual connections are used to keep customer data separate. So why have both virtual channels and virtual paths? Good question. Because a virtual path contains multiple virtual channels, ATM network equipment can make switching decisions based on the virtual path information only or on the VPI-VCI combination as needed. This two-level hierarchy allows trunking or switching one virtual path instead of many individual virtual circuits where the switches do not need to look at each and every virtual circuit to make a switching decision. In the switch currently shown on screen, all VCIs on VPI0 are switched to VPI1 and vice versa. This approach is known as virtual path switching, where the VCIs are ignored by the ATM switch. In this example, the switch is making virtual path and virtual channel switching decisions by looking at the VPI and VCI values. For example, Cells received on port 1, VPI 4, VCI 400, are switched to port 3, VPI 1, VCI 202. The ATM specifications describe how to build these virtual connections and transmit data between ATM devices. Atop that, also at layer 2, are the ATM Adaption Layer, or AAL, specifications, which describe how to encapsulate upper layer protocols into ATM. The ATM adaption layer is responsible for segmenting the packet into fixed length cells of 48 bytes each. The receiving device will reassemble the cells into the original packet. Once the data is segmented, the ATM layer then adds a 5 byte header to create an ATM cell, which is now ready for transmission across the ATM network. Like we've seen before, the ATM network devices or switches will only read the cell headers, not the data contents or payload of the cell. As we have with PPP and Frame Relay, let's take a closer look at the ATM header. Use your mouse to roll over the different fields in the 5-byte ATM cell header to learn about their meaning and functionality. Click Continue when you are ready to move on. Earlier we mentioned that ATM was designed to transport voice, video, and data with guaranteed quality of service, or QoS, for each type of traffic. Each type of traffic has very different needs. For example, voice traffic needs to be transferred very quickly, in real time, without any delay. The same is true of video traffic, so that movies don't look like they're running in slow motion, except that video traffic is more bandwidth intensive than voice traffic. Data traffic, on the other hand, can tolerate end-to-end -end network delay, but is sensitive to data loss. To accommodate each type of traffic and guarantee a specific type of QoS, ATM virtual connections have an associated traffic contract. An ATM traffic contract is an agreement between a user and a network where the network guarantees a specific ATM service category if the user's data conforms to the negotiated traffic and QoS parameters. To learn more about ATM traffic descriptors, QoS parameters, and ATM service categories, click the on-screen link, or click the Continue button to continue with this topic. As we've seen, ATM offers valuable VPN services, such as guaranteed QoS and the ability to prioritize one type of traffic over another. ATM is a very complicated technology, so we've covered only the basics here. 
When it was initially introduced in the 1980s, ATM offered massive amounts of bandwidth with speeds of 155 megabits per second and 622 megabits per second. But by today's standards, these speeds are fairly slow. In addition, ATM networks are also very expensive to deploy, operate, and manage. And in some places, ATM isn't even available. Today, instead of ATM or frame relay, service providers are turning to a different technology called multi-protocol label switching, or MPLS, to provide VPN services. MPLS provides a way to build VPNs on top of any Layer 2 connection. We'll discuss the details of MPLS VPNs in the next section. Today, the Acme Company is a multinational organization and wants to be able to communicate securely with any location at any time. As we just saw, it could have built a Layer 2 VPN using either Frame Relay or ATM. Unfortunately, any-to-any -any communication using either Frame Relay or ATM requires a full mesh of virtual connections, which is an expensive and time-consuming network to build. And, in some places, Frame Relay or ATM services aren't even available. What if Acme Company could have a single physical connection to its WAN service provider, send IP packets, and get VPN services regardless of the provider's Layer 2 protocol, whether it is Frame Relay, ATM, PPP, or even Ethernet. And best of all, what if it could have all of these benefits with minimal investment and effort, leaving the provider to establish and manage the interconnections or mesh? That scenario is what multi-protocol label switching, or MPLS, is all about. MPLS provides the privacy and security of a Frame Relay or ATM network yet allows for the inherent any-to-any -any connectivity and flexibility typical of an IP-based network. Today, service providers can offer MPLS VPNs at a much more affordable price than traditional frame relay and ATM VPNs. So many customers are transitioning their old frame relay or ATM-based VPNs to MPLS VPNs, and often they're using Ethernet as their Layer 2 protocol of choice to do it. You'll remember earlier we discussed Ethernet as a LAN technology. Ethernet is a very simple protocol, unlike ATM, and Ethernet speeds have steadily increased from 10 megabits per second to 10 gigabits per second. With future speeds of 40 to 100 gigabits per second, Ethernet offers higher bandwidth at a much lower cost than traditional WAN technologies. So while Ethernet was once used solely as a LAN technology, more and more customers are using Ethernet as both a LAN and WAN technology. So how does MPLS work? Let's start with the basics. First, unlike Frame Relay and ATM, which are Layer 2 protocols, MPLS isn't a Layer 2 protocol or even a Layer 3 protocol. Instead, MPLS sits between Layer 2 and Layer 3 and is often referred to as a Layer 2.5 protocol. Like Frame Relay, MPLS is an encapsulation and packet switching technique used to route data over a WAN. But MPLS can be used over any Layer 2 technology, including PPP or Ethernet, making it far more flexible. Here you can see that an MPLS label is added to a Layer 3 packet, in this case an IP packet, before it is encapsulated in a Layer 2 frame. This frame could be an Ethernet frame, PPP frame, or some other type of frame. Some people refer to MPLS as being Layer 2 agnostic, meaning that MPLS supports any Layer 3 protocol running over any Layer 2 network. Hence, the term multi-protocol. In practice, however, IP is almost always the Layer 3 protocol of choice. Taking a look at part of Acme Company's current network, you can see that the company is now using MPLS to interconnect the three locations shown on screen. Notice that some of the connections between Acme's router and the provider's network are running different Layer 2 protocols. For example, the router at corporate headquarters is using Ethernet as its Layer 2 protocol, and Site 1 is using PPP as its Layer 2 protocol. When Acme built its Layer 2 VPN using Frame Relay, it used virtual circuits to connect each location. MPLS takes a slightly different approach. Instead of using virtual circuits, MPLS uses label-switched paths to connect each location. Notice that in this network, these paths start and end on the provider's routers, not the customer's routers. 
Acme simply needs one physical connection using any type of Layer 2 protocol to connect to its provider's network. No logical or virtual connections are needed, as is the case with Frame Relay. Just like the other technologies, MPLS has its own set of terminology. A label switched path is known as an LSP. An LSP is similar to a Frame Relay virtual circuit, except that it is not dependent on a particular Layer 2 technology. One big difference, however, is that an LSP is unidirectional, so customers need a matching LSP in the opposite direction. Typically, both LSPs follow the same path in the network, as we show here. However, it's not a requirement, and LSPs can take other paths. For simplicity, we're only going to show one LSP for each location. Now let's review a few more MPLS terms. Routers running the MPLS protocol are known as Label Switching Routers, or LSRs. Here, the provider has many LSRs within its MPLS network, which is also known as an MPLS domain. The MPLS domain also has three ingress LSRs, which are also known as Label Edge Routers, or LERs. A Label Edge Router is a special type of LSR that is responsible for assigning the appropriate MPLS label to a packet. When the customer's data arrives at the provider's MPLS domain, the Ingress LER strips the Layer 2 frame and looks at the IP header. The incoming frame can be encapsulated as Ethernet, PPP, or another format. Regardless of the frame's Layer 2 format, the LER strips off the Layer 2 frame to inspect the packet. It then adds an MPLS header. So how does the LER know which label to assign and ultimately which path, or LSP, the packets take? LERs can look at any number of fields in the IP header when doing MPLS label and LSP assignment. For instance, the LER can assign labels based on the destination IP network, a combination of the destination network and application type, source and destination networks, or a specific QoS requirement. In our example, the LER is simply looking at the destination IP network to assign a label. Each label also translates to an MPLS forwarding equivalency class, or FEC. A FEC is a group of packets that will be treated or forwarded the same way within the provider's MPLS domain. Packets belonging to the same FEC get assigned the same MPLS label and follow the same LSP. So in this network, packets going from Site 1 to Headquarters follow the blue LSP, and packets going from Site 1 to Site 2 follow the yellow LSP. The label in the packet identifies the FEC, as well as the LSP to be used. Here we see that an LER has received data from Acme Site 1. The LER strips the Layer 2 frame and inspects the IP header to determine which label to assign. After adding or pushing an MPLS label on a packet, the LER encapsulates the label packet in the appropriate Layer 2 frame and forwards the label packet along the associated LSP. Each LSR in the path makes a forwarding decision based solely on the contents of the label. The LSR strips off the Layer 2 frame, performs a lookup using the MPLS label, removes or pops the old label, and puts on or pushes a new one, telling the next hop how to forward the labeled packet. This label lookup and label swap is very similar to what we saw earlier with frame relay or ATM switches. The LSR then encapsulates the labeled packet in a new Layer 2 frame and forwards it on the LSP. The next router repeats the same process. It removes the old label and adds a new one based solely on the ports and labels in its switching table. Notice that neither this router nor the previous one examined the data's IP header. Because these routers only look at the MPLS labels, they are referred to as transit LSRs. This router now encapsulates the labeled packet in a new Layer 2 frame and forwards it on the LSP. When the labeled packet reaches the end of the LSP, an egress LER removes the Layer 2 frame and the MPLS label. Next, it examines the destination IP address to determine the next hop. It encapsulates the packet in the appropriate Layer 2 frame and sends it out the appropriate interface. Notice that the IP packet originally entered the MPLS network using PPP and exited the MPLS cloud using Ethernet. MPLS works independently of the Layer 2 technology. 
MPLS label-based switching methods allow routers to make forwarding decisions based on the contents of a simple label, rather than by performing a complex route lookup based on destination IP address. Click the link on screen for a more detailed discussion on how MPLS label switching differs from traditional IP routing, or click the Continue button to continue with this topic. We mentioned earlier that some people refer to MPLS as a Layer 2.5 technology. Here you see the MPLS header, which is sometimes referred to as a shim header because it's located between the Layer 2 and Layer 3 headers. Because the label is inserted between the Layer 2 and Layer 3 header, a single LSP can traverse frame relay, PPP, and Ethernet networks. Move your mouse over any field to learn more about it. The MPLS standards define many different types of services, such as MPLS Layer 2 and Layer 3 VPNs, Virtual Private LAN Services, or VPLS, Generalized MPLS, MPLS Traffic Engineering, and Network Management. Layer 3 MPLS VPNs, which are also known as IP VPNs, are becoming increasingly popular among service providers. So let's take a quick look at them in detail. A deeper discussion of other MPLS services is beyond the scope of this course. In this network, Customer A and Customer B require connectivity between their three locations. The service provider needs to provide connectivity between the different locations on the shared IP network. Earlier we saw that Frame Relay VPNs use PVCs to provide connectivity between locations. With MPLS, the provider uses LSPs to provide that connectivity. Here you can see that each VPN is represented by a different color LSP. Notice that the mesh of LSPs starts at the provider's routers, not the customer routers, which is very different from Frame Relay. Like MPLS, Layer 3 MPLS VPNs also introduce a new set of terminology. First, the Customer Edge Router, or CE Router, within an individual site uses a single physical connection to connect to a Provider Edge Router or PE Router using any Layer 2 protocol. The Customer Edge Router does not even run MPLS. In fact, the Customer Edge Router doesn't even know it is connecting to an MPLS Layer 3 VPN. With Layer 3 MPLS VPNs, the Provider Edge Routers do all the work. Provider Edge Routers are a type of label edge router and must provide completely private and secure connectivity within a VPN. At a high level, the Provider Edge Router accomplishes this task by building an LSP between other Provider Edge Routers for each customer location. But Provider Edge Routers do more than assign labels. The Provider Edge Routers also exchange routing information with Customer Edge Routers. The Provider Edge Router stores the customer's routing information in a Virtual Routing and Forwarding Table, or instance, which is known as a VRF. VRFs are specific to a customer or VPN and are not shared. To help explain MPLS Layer 3 VPNs, we've simplified the network a bit. In this example, each Provider Edge Router has a connection to Customer A and Customer B. The Provider Edge and Customer Edge Routers exchange routing information. The routes are stored in the Customer's VRF on the Provider Edge Router. Notice that each customer has a separate and unique VRF. The Provider Edge Routers also establish LSPs between each customer's VRF. These LSPs are like Frame Relay PVCs and are used to keep customer traffic separated. When the Provider Edge Router receives a packet from the Customer Edge Router, it performs a route lookup in the customer's VRF, determines which LSP should be used to reach the destination network, labels the packet, and sends it on the appropriate LSP. In this example, you'll also notice that there are several Provider or P routers that do not connect to customer devices and only perform label switching. They don't directly participate in the VPN. The P routers, which are transit LSRs, only perform a label lookup and label swap and are not even aware of the VPN. When the label packet arrives at the egress provider edge router, it strips off the label, encapsulates the packet in a layer two frame appropriate to that network and sends the packet out the appropriate interface. This section briefly touched on basic MPLS terminology and concepts. 
It also provided a brief overview of MPLS Layer 3 VPNs, which more and more customers are starting to implement in lieu of Frame Relay or ATM-based VPNs. In our next section, we'll discuss different Layer 4 protocols.